Good afternoon. My name is Lawrence Sherman. I'm the director of the Jerry Lee Center for Experimental Criminology at the University of Cambridge Institute of Criminology. It is my honor to introduce the Jerry Lee Lectureship in Experimental Criminology each year as the closing event of the Stockholm Criminology Symposium. This year, we're extremely privileged to have as the Jerry Lee Lecturer for the 2021 Stockholm Criminology Symposium, Professor Jens Ludwig of the University of Chicago and the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professor uh, Ludwig, uh, who is the Bergman Professor uh, at the University of Chicago, where he is also Director of the University's Crime Lab and Co-Director of their Education Lab, a Co-Director of the National Bureau of Economic Research Group on the Economics of Crime, and the Crime Program Chair at the uh, J-PAL um, MIT Poverty Lab doing uh, experiments all over the world on how to make the lives of uh, underprivileged people uh, better, safer, healthier, and better educated. All of these works that he has uh, performed in the name of advancing knowledge for better policy to improve people's lives um, have been strongly influenced by the experimental tradition uh, which this lectureship recognizes. And in his own work, uh, he has looked at such diverse issues as early childhood interventions uh, with uh, children from uh, underprivileged backgrounds, cognitive behavioral therapy in juvenile detention centers in Chicago, forecasting the risk of offenders on pretrial release, and um, most importantly, from the kind of work that we're doing in the UK and the US at the moment for immediate reductions in gun violence, uh, he has studied and evaluated police strategies in that area. I'm very pleased to say that uh, uh, this 2012 electee to the Institute of Medicine at the National Academies of Science in the United States um, and fellow of the Academy of of criminology, of experimental criminology in the US is going to address gun violence, uh, recognizing the theme of the honors to this year's Stockholm Prize in Criminology winners. Um, uh, that would be Professor Philip Cook, uh, as well as Professor Franklin Zimmering, who many of you would have heard give the prize lecture yesterday. Uh, his work, uh, Professor Ludwig's work, will build on other presentations that have confronted this problem uh, in this symposium and will be uh, the final presentation in the symposium. I will return uh, upon his completion uh, to apologize that we won't be able to take questions and answers, but we will be uh, very pleased to have you return to the Stockholm Criminology Symposium next year, uh, if at all possible, in person in Stockholm. But now let me please introduce Professor Jens, Jens Ludwig, uh, Jens, you have the floor. Terrific. Um, thank you very much, Larry, for the for the very kind introduction. Um, thanks so much for having me be part of this wonderful event. It's a it's a great honor to be here and doing this. It's a great honor to be introduced by uh, the person I think of as the father of experimental criminology. And it's um, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Um, do we have my my screen up now? Um, and it's also a great honor to be here uh, at this year's event doing this, um, given the two wonderful researchers who are being honored this year. Uh, Frank Zimmering has been a hero of mine for, uh, for a long, long time. And uh, Phil Cook, it would be hard for me to overstate what Phil has meant to me personally over the last 30 years. It's hard to believe it's been 30 years as a mentor and a friend. Everything that I've learned about how to do research has really come from working with Phil. I'm so sorry that we're not there uh, all in person in, in Stockholm this year, but um, it's been a terrific event nonetheless, and I'm so delighted to be a part of it. Um, this session, as Larry mentioned, is also very, um, very timely. If we look at what's happening in the United States right now, um, as I think everybody on this, uh, let me just uh, focus for the moment on the US experience, as I think most people, who are part of this symposium are, uh, are well aware of um, after uh, long-term declines in uh, serious crimes, including gun violence in the United States, 
we are seeing double digit percentage increases uh, across cities uh, all over the United States. And we're starting to see concerns about crime this year in ways that we just haven't seen um, for decades. If you have been following the New York City mayor's race, you see that crime has now become the, uh, uh, the, top, public, uh, the top concern to voters uh, in New York City now after they'd experienced a 90% drop in homicides since the early 1990s. And all of this is occurring against a backdrop of um, against the backdrop of um, growing attention to and appreciation for the importance of criminal justice reform as well. We can see survey data showing um, huge support in the United States for rethinking how the criminal justice system does what it does. Um, and we saw uh, over the last year, millions of people all across the country, in fact, millions of people all over the world marching for change to the criminal justice system as well. So this is a perfect time to be having this conversation. Um, what I wanted to do for starters is, is talk about um, how we got where we are in thinking about addressing the crime problem, uh, the problem of gun violence in the United States, and then offer uh, what I've come to think of as an exciting um, and interesting alternative. And we'll see if uh, all of you agree by the end of the talk. But let me start off with um, some survey data that runs up through um, 1994, which as uh, I think most people in the symposium will, will know, was a landmark year in the United States because it's when um, President, then President Bill Clinton signed what at that time was the largest crime bill in US history. And this is a survey question that doesn't get asked maybe as often as it uh, productively could, but there's a question that sometimes gets asked of the American public where uh, they're asked, what do you think is causing crime? And what you can see here is 20% uh, of the people um, of Americans in 94 thought crime was due to the failure of the criminal justice system to do something about criminals. Uh, crisis of personal values was another 30% and drugs was the, uh, another 20% of the causes of crime. And if you look at other survey data, you see that Americans for better or for worse, tend to view people who use drugs, people who are involved in the drug market as um, essentially bad people uh, is what the survey data suggests. And so as of 1994, I think you could say that the dominant hypothesis among the American public was the main cause of crime in different forms is some version of bad people. This is a hypothesis that's been with us for thousands of years. We see bad acts, we naturally attribute it to bad people, to the extent to which there was an alternative hypothesis over this period, something like one in 12 Americans named some version of poverty as the leading cause of crime. Okay, so that's really the conventional wisdom that we've had in the US and not just in the United States for the last several decades in thinking about the, the causes of crime. And that naturally has translated over then into thinking about how we've designed our policies to respond to this problem. And then you might wonder how, how are things going? Well, one thing that this orientation has done is it's uh, gotten us in, here in the United States over the last 50 years to build the world's largest prison system with the highest incarceration rate per capita in the world. And I think everyone in the symposium will be well aware that another key feature uh, of the US prison system is the very disproportionate representation of uh, people from communities of color, African Americans and Hispanics in uh, jails and prisons all across the United States is just a representative uh, statistic from a randomly selected state of Massachusetts. Um, nor has this policy approach necessarily solved the problem um, that we're so worried about, which is uh, crime and, and gun violence in particular. If you look at the murder rate that we have in the United States on a per capita basis, it would be unimaginable in, in almost any other rich country in the world. You can see the homicide rate of uh, about five per 100,000 in the United States dwarfs what we see in almost any other country. Um, we can, uh, any other rich country, we can see that almost all of that difference in murder rates is due to a difference in gun murders. And we can also see that within the United States, akin to the racial disparities that we see in imprisonment, uh, we also see massive racial disparities in murder victimization in America as well. Um, so 
that's our status quo here in, uh, in 2021. And if anything, things seem to be taking a turn for the worse because the, the, the violent crime problem is getting worse now. That makes you wonder if we could rewind the clock and uh, have taken a different approach. Uh, as I, I mentioned, the other leading uh, alternative idea that we've had on the table for most of the last 50 years has been to address the so-called root causes of crime. What if we had addressed poverty in, in, instead? And I think everyone who's part of this symposium will recognize that addressing poverty is extraordinarily important for, uh, for many, many reasons um, for its own sake. Uh, I've done a lot of research myself uh, about different policy strategies to reduce poverty. I think the separate question is if we had solved the poverty problem, which would be an enormously important accomplishment in its own sake, would that have the secondary benefit of also addressing the crime problem or solving the crime problem as well? What do we know about that? And so, um, you know, one place that you might start is to note that the United States did try uh, to do this at some point. Uh, many of you will remember that President Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s declared unconditional war on poverty. And you can see, if you look at the official poverty statistics in the United States, you can see that the war on poverty in many ways was a success. The poverty rate uh, by the end of the uh, by the end of the 1960s was roughly speaking about half what it was at the beginning of this period. Some combination of economic growth and war on poverty programs contributed to a massive reduction in poverty over this period. Now you might wonder to yourself um, with that sort of progress, uh, amazing progress in reducing poverty in America, by how much did crime rates fall over the, over the 1960s period? And so, it is with great disappointment that we would note that the murder rate, if anything, doubled over this period. Now, this is a very sophisticated criminology audience. You will look at this and recognize as uh, this is just a bivariate correlation between two, two time series. This doesn't, this is, lots of other things were changing over this time period. This isn't necessarily evidence of everything, of anything, especially in a Jerry Lee lecture about experimental criminology. Um, so it is revealing that, or it's, it's interesting to see that this is what we see uh, from social science research that follows the natural experiment paradigm um, as well. So when people like Amanda Egan um, go out and um, use existing policy variation uh, across places in, um, in economic conditions, here's what they find. So specifically what Amanda is doing uh, and her co-authors in this paper is exploiting the fact that states vary enormously within the United States and also to some extent over time in the level, the state level of the minimum wage. And she's looking at rearrest rates to people exiting state prisons in the United States in, in different states where there's a different binding minimum wage. And what you can see is that property crimes declines, uh, decline um, and drug crimes or drug rearrest rates are also lower when people are exiting prison in states with relatively higher minimum wages, but that doesn't seem to be the case for violent crime. And that same sort of pattern is something that we see over and over again in lots of different natural experiment studies of criminal behavior. It raises the hypothesis that different types of criminal behavior might have different determinants. Um, the public tends to think of crime as a single type of behavior. Um, I think this graph uh, leads easily to the hypothesis that uh, the word crime might, if anything, do more to obscure than to clarify. It's an umbrella term for lots of different sorts of behaviors that might have different determinants. And that's also important, I think, because crimes um, aren't just different in their determinants, they're also different in their social consequences. So um, Aaron Chalfin and Justin McCrary have a wonderful paper in the Review of Economics and Statistics in 2018, where they look at data from American cities and uh, they show the distribution of, uh, of crimes across different crime types. And you can see essentially almost all crimes in American cities are some combination of property offenses or assaults. That dominates the, the, the distribution of crimes, that, that dominates the crime counts that we see in American cities. You can't even see murder on this graph. That's because murders are one fifth of 1% of, uh, 
of all crimes in American cities. If we accounted for unreported crime, it would be an even lower proportion, a lower share than that. Um, on the other hand, what happens when you look not at the crime count, but the social harm from crime? And so Phil uh, Cook has been one of the leaders in helping uh, economists think about how to measure the social harms from crime. What happens if you look at the social harms from crime instead? And what you see here is that fully 70% of all the social harms of crime in American cities come from homicides. The 0.2% of all crimes that are murders account for 70% of all the social harms of crime. And as everybody in the symposium will know, the overwhelming majority of murders in the United States are committed with guns. If we included the social harms from non-fatal shootings, gun violence would account for an even larger share of the total social harms of crime. And so it's very fitting here to pause and quote one of Frank Zimmering's books, which is it, in, the real lesson here is in the United States, crime is not the problem, as Frank noted. It's really, we don't have a crime problem, we have a gun violence problem, okay? And I think the key lesson to tie this back to the poverty story is, Poverty is enormously important in understanding the determinants of property crime. Poverty, maybe surprisingly, doesn't seem to be uh, at nearly as closely tied to the type of crime that is driving the crime problem in the United States, which is violence and gun violence in, in particular. OK. Um, notice the common thread between the two policy approaches that I mentioned here, the, both the stick approach criminal justice sanctions and the carrot approach of anti-poverty programming, both essentially have a theory of change here that act on, it's a very Gary Becker sort of view of human behavior where we imagine people are weighing benefits and costs and thinking about the, whether they uh, will be involved in crime uh, through some sort of uh, more or less rational deliberation. Uh, that is to say both carrots and sticks work on people's intentions. And um, I think we can see that for the gun violence problem, it's not clear that that paradigm uh, necessarily is the, is the right one or the complete one for understanding what's driving the behavior that underlies gun violence. Um, now, of course, these aren't the only two strategies that we've been uh, following to try and reduce uh, violence in the United States. So when Blueprints for Violence Prevention went out a few years ago with Department of Justice funding, and reviewed 600 programs that had some decent or semi-decent evaluation to try and prevent violence, what did they find? They found that of the nearly 600 programs they, they reviewed, only 30 were uh, judged to be model, uh, model programs or even promising programs. That is to say, uh, put differently, about 5% of the programs that they reviewed worked. Um, and I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, we as a social science field don't have a great understanding right now about what it is that distinguishes the 5% from the 95%. We try lots of different things to prevent violence. It's really a grab bag of different sorts of things. Sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work. And I don't think that we've got a very well-developed conceptual framework for helping us understand what sort of uh, approaches are most promising. And so I think that's really, to me, the, the status quo right now in terms of thinking about changing the behavioral side of, of what drives gun violence. Um, I know Phil and Frank have spent uh, their careers thinking about gun control and the, and the policy side, and I'm, um, I'm not gonna have much to say about that during this presentation. Um, so what I wanna uh, do instead is then, if you think, sort of think about the, the behavioral part, uh, if you think of gun violence as guns plus violence, what can we do? to address the violence part of that equation. Um, and what I wanted to do with the rest of my time is talk you through a very different way of kind of seeing the determinants of uh, a violent behavior that really has, uh, uh, I've come to, um, to think is a very promising approach through a lot of the work that we've been doing here in the city of Chicago through the research center I help run, which is University of Chicago Crime Lab. Um, so what's a different perspective on, on this? Now, 
Um, if we were in person in Stockholm, uh, we'd be in some uh, big and surely beautiful uh, auditorium. And um, what I would do to help you see this alternative perspective of what might drive violent behavior, what I would do is talk you through an audience participation exercise as follows. And what I would have done if we were in person is I would have said, I'm going to talk you through an audience participation exercise that will require you to call out the color of, I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides with some objects in the middle of the slide and I want you to call out the color of the object in the middle of the slide. And so I would have, oh, actually, actually before I would have gotten to the uh, audience participation exercise, sorry. Um, before that, let me first, before I give you my theory of what's driving uh, violent behavior, let me be a little bit more concrete about what the behavior is exactly that we're even trying to understand. Because um, I think this also can be a little bit confusing, especially for people in the general public, given the non-representative information they have about crime and uh, crime and violence. And so what I wanted to do uh, before I, I give you our theory about what's driving violent behavior is I wanted to talk you through a concrete example of uh, what gun violence in America actually looks like. And this is a more or less randomly selected example from um, uh, from the Chicago Tribune. This happened a few years ago. You can see June 2nd, 2012. This was a Saturday here in Chicago. It happened about three o'clock in the afternoon in the South Shore neighborhood. So this is only about two miles uh, southeast from my office where I am now here at the University of Chicago. And so what happened um, in this event was uh, two groups of teens are standing at the intersection of 73rd and Coles, uh, 73rd Street and Coles Avenue in the South Shore neighborhood, arguing about whether uh, a kid in one of the groups stole a bike from a kid in the other group. And um, the two groups start to separate. So there's no self-defense rationale, uh, it seems, for what happened next, which is that someone from one of the groups pulled a semi-automatic handgun from their waistband and fired into the other group and hit a 16-year-old named Jamal Lockett in the chest. Uh, the emergency uh, medical services respond um, and uh, the University of Chicago Trauma Center had not been opened at that time. EMS races this, uh, this kid down Lakeshore Drive to Northwestern's emergency room in downtown Chicago where he's pronounced, um, where he's pronounced dead. Two weeks later, the police arrest a 17-year-old shooter in this case. Um, this is what gun violence is in the, in the United States. Um, uh, as far as we can uh, tell from the data, when um, Becky Block and Richard Block assembled the most detailed uh, comprehensive data set of homicides in any American city that I know of, collecting data over the 1965 to 1995 period on homicides, you can see a very small share of the murders in Chicago are sexual assaults. A very, um, a relatively modest share of these are driven by what criminologists call instrumental motives. That is um, mo uh, premeditated uh, violence over uh, things like um, uh, drug turf or some sort of instrumental goal like that. The large majority of murders in Chicago and in many cities across the United States really stem from altercations um, consistent with uh, Jamal Lockett's killing from 2012 that I just described. Now, how do we make sense of these sorts of shootings? Um, it wasn't self-defense and the sort of Gary Becker, uh, you know, the, the Gary Becker sort of perspective also doesn't seem to give us much leverage in understanding this kind of event because um, you know, the murder was committed on a crowded street at three o'clock in the afternoon in broad daylight. So the chances that the offender would eventually get caught were, uh, would seem to have been very high. And it's also not clear that the benefit side of the crime equation here can explain what happened because the resale value, if you check Craigslist, the resale value of a used bike here on the south side of Chicago usually isn't much more than something like 50 bucks. So how do we understand this? And so now if we were in person, I would have talked you through this audience participation game where I would have asked you to call out the color of the object in the middle of the slide. And I would have shown you this slide where you would have said black. I would have shown you this slide where you would have said red. I'd show you this slide, you would have said green. I'd show you this slide where you'd say yellow. 
And then I'd show you this slide where some of you might have said orange, but if uh, past experience is any guide, most of you, uh, many or most of you would have said blue instead, despite the instructions to focus on the, um, uh, the color of the object. Now, what is this? So if you've taken, uh, if you're uh, a psychologist, you'll recognize this as one of the most famous uh, experimental tests in all of psychology. It's called this group test. So why did I show you this group test? If you've read uh, Danny Kahneman's wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, you'll be familiar with the psychological idea of um, uh, uh, dual system cognition, or basically the, the idea is the following, which is, I think what behavioral science and psychologists have, uh, have learned over the last several decades is thinking is enormously difficult for people. We don't like to do it unless we absolutely have to. Psychologists call deliberate cognition, which is what most of us think of thinking when we say the word thinking. Um, psychologists call that system two thinking. Um, that's e effortful. We try not to do it unless we absolutely have to because it's so draining. And so what we do instead is we develop a series of automatic responses that help us that are adaptive to situations we see over and over again in our daily lives. Um, psychologists call those that system one thinking or system one responses. And so in the Stroop test, um, you can see the, the task that we see over and over again in daily life is we see a word. Now, if we had to deliberately, uh, deliberately think about whenever we saw a word, should I read this? And we did that all day, every day, that would be enormously exhausting for us mentally. So we've developed an automatic response that when we see a word, we read the word, we don't even think uh, of doing it, right? Um, we do it automatically. And the key thing with these automatic responses is they're designed to be um, fast, easy, and but not necessarily accurate. They work for situations, they're adaptive for most of the situations that we see over and over again in our daily lives, but they can be maladaptive when they're overgeneralized. And what the Stroop test is designed to do is to highlight that fact. Um, normally it's adaptive to see word, read word, and what the Stroop test does is it gets you to see you're not even conscious of your automatic response here to see word, read word, because that is the maladaptive. Uh, you wouldn't do that if you, uh, if you were thinking deliberately about your behavior in this group test. The adaptive response here would have been see word, say color, see color. Now, I think that this, uh, this exercise helps us um, see what could be going on with um, some of the violence that we have in uh, some of the gun violence that we have in cities like Chicago and, and cities all over the United States. One of the things that we've learned from research in, um, in sociology and uh, an ethno uh, a wonderful ethnographic literature by people like Andy Papa Christos and others, and what uh, I've seen from talking to people in neighborhoods on the south and west sides of Chicago, is that unfortunately, unfortunately, um, in many, many under-resourced neighborhoods in American cities, uh, the institutions of what sociologists and criminologists would call um, formal and informal social control are overwhelmed. And um, teenagers in these neighborhoods, young people become vulnerable to violence victimization. And uh, they learn that it is adaptive to fight back and fight back hard whenever they get challenged as a way to establish deterrence in some sense at a, at a retail level, to let other people in the neighborhood know that they're not easy victims. Um, psychologist Aaron Beck at the University of Pennsylvania calls it retaliation as communication. So that's the automatic response um, that's adaptive for getting challenged out of school over and over again for uh, lots of young people, unfortunately. In, in lots of neighborhoods in American cities all over the country. So get challenged, the automatic adaptive response usually is I get challenged, I push back. Now that response might normally be adaptive but can, can lead to tragedy when it's overgeneralized to a situation like when someone has a gun, okay? And I think what this helps you see, what behavioral science helps us see is we can begin to make sense of why situational influences, why neighborhood effects on violence in particular are so powerful. So, you know, the sort of neighborhood that I, uh, that, that I have in mind here is 
like South Shore, like Woodlawn, like Washington Park, some of the under-resourced, disadvantaged, segregated neighborhoods that we have here on the south side of Chicago, adjacent to the Hyde Park neighborhood that's home to the University of Chicago, where I live as well. Um, things are very different in better resourced neighborhoods like Hyde Park. The university puts security guards on almost every street corner of the neighborhood. If you're a teenager growing up in Hyde Park, it's um, the automatic response to getting the, the right automatic response to getting challenged outside of school anytime is to just comply. There's no need to develop an automatic response to push back because you always have the option of running to a security guard on any one of the, the local corners and ask them for help. And so the key point here is it's not that the people, the kids in Washington Park and Woodlawn and South Shore are intrinsically different from the kids growing up in Hyde Park. It's that more deliberate cognition is needed to successfully navigate under-resourced neighborhoods like we see in Washington Park, Woodlawn, and South Shore. Um, or put differently, it's easier to get away with being automatic and rely on system one responses in a better resourced neighborhood like Hyde Park than an under-resourced neighborhood. So behavioral science gives us um, this way to understand why violence rates in particular vary so much across places. Um, now that idea, so, so far what I've outlined is an interesting um, hypothesis, and that's a hypothesis that's, that's, that sits behind an increasingly large share of the field experiments, as Larry mentioned, that we've been doing in Chicago over the last 10 years since we founded the crime lab. Um, and as an experimental um, crime researcher myself, I would say it's a, an interesting and plausible hypothesis, but I wouldn't believe it until I'd seen some evidence from multiple randomized trials um, to see if there's really um, some truth behind this. And so let me talk you through the very first experiment, uh, the very first field experiment that we did here at the crime lab um, about eight or 10 years ago now, uh, which we did in close partnership with a, a local nonprofit in Chicago called Youth Guidance. And, um, you know, we selected Youth Guidance through a design competition. We um, solicited the, the best possible ideas for, uh, for youth violence prevention from nonprofits and government agencies. And through that profit process, we picked Youth Guidance and the Becoming a Man program. And, to help you see what Becoming a Man does and help you connect it to the, the theory that we're testing here, let me describe the very first exercise um, that kids do in BAM. So the way that BAM works is it's for um, uh, middle school and high school age uh, male students um, uh, living in some of the most uh, disadvantaged under-resourced neighborhoods in Chicago and the South and West Sides. Um, there's a parallel program for girls that Youth Guidance does now called Working on Womanhood, but Becoming a Man is for, uh, for boys. And uh, it's a program that gets kids to meet once a week in school. They get to miss an academic class uh, once a week for this program. They come in. And the very first exercise that the, um, the kids do in the Becoming a Man program is the group leader divides the kids up into pairs and um, gives one of the kids in the pair a rubber ball and then turns to the other kid uh, in each pair and says, you have 30 seconds to get the ball from your partner's hand. Uh, the clock is ticking, go. And um, what almost all the, the kids uh, wind up doing in this fist exercise is relying on physical force to get the, um, uh, the ball from the other kid. So if Larry and I would be partners in this, uh, in this BAM fist exercise, you know, they would um, give me the ball first and uh, Larry would start off by doing something like trying to pry my hand open. And then when that didn't work, he would uh, do something like put me in a headlock. And when that didn't work, he might try um, some other, you know, he might try, you can imagine what Larry's gonna try in this case. And uh, that goes on for 30 seconds. And then the group leader will say, uh, we'll call time and then we'll switch. And uh, now Larry gets the ball in his hand and I try and get the ball from Larry. And I would do the same thing um, to Larry in return. 
And um, after, 30, after that 30 second period, the group leader will ask the kids to reconvene and do a debrief and get them to reflect on what just happened. And the, um, the group leader will say, we'll start off by saying um, some version of, uh, so Larry, tell me what strategies you tried to get the ball out of your partner's hand and how it went. And Larry will say some version of, um, you know, I started off trying to pry the ball out of Jens's hand and um, I thought it would be easy. I mean, just look at him. Turned out to be hard. He's stronger than he looks. Uh, turned out to be harder than I had anticipated. I think I broke his his pinky and maybe his thumb, but I couldn't get the uh, couldn't get the ball out. And then here are the other strategies I tried. And then you called time. And then the group leader will say to Larry, or that the teenage equivalent of Larry, um, "Why didn't you ask Jens for the ball?" Right now, over the you know the the ten or fifteen years that Youth Guidance has be been doing the Becoming a Man program with kids all over Chicago. They've been doing this with thousands of kids now. And uh, almost none of the kids ever ask their partners for the ball. So they get almost no instructions about getting the ball from their partner. They're just told, get the ball from your partner. And almost all the kids resort to physical force. And so the teenage analog of Larry in this exercise will say some version of, oh, I didn't ask because if I would have asked him, he would have thought I was A. And you can imagine what the teenage version of Larry Sherman will say in that case. And then the group leader turns to the other kid in the pair, so that would be me in this example, and say, Jens, what would you have done if you had been asked for the, for the ball? And most of the teenagers say, I would have just given it to him. It's just a stupid rubber ball, and it's much better than getting my finger broken and then having Larry Sherman put me in a headlock and, and so on and so on. Now, if you're familiar with the psychology literature, you will recognize this is a form of a thing that Ken Dodge taught us about many decades ago called hostile attribution bias, that in a neighborhood that's very dangerous where uh, the, the costs of getting victimized are uh, much higher than the costs of assuming you're about to be victimized, it might be uh, adaptive in most situations to assume that other people around you have hostile intent, but you don't think about when you're deploying that, that, uh, that assumption, you just deploy it automatically and that can get you into trouble in lots of situations. And this is, a, to me, a very clever experiential way to help the kids in the same way that the Stroop test helps us as an audience see our automatic responses. The FIST, I think, is a very clever experiential way to help teenage kids see their own automatic responses and see how they can be maladaptive when they're overgeneralized, right? And then becoming a man then gives them lots of strategies to recognize what their automatic responses are and better understand when they can be overgeneralized um, and, and what to do instead. Now, that gives you a flavor of what the program does. And so what does it actually do in practice? Is this actually helpful? So we, a few years ago, we um, published a paper uh, uh, Sarah Heller was the lead author. Uh, Anud Shah is a wonderful psychologist here at the University of Chicago in the business school, helped us understand the psychology. Um, and we published a paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics where we reported the results of several randomized uh, large scale field experiments here. And the first experiment that we did uh, was carried out in the 2009 2010 academic year with, as you can see, 2,700. Um, seventh through 10th graders here in Chicago. And what we saw measuring uh, violent crime involvement through uh, official administrative arrest data is a 45% reduction in violent crime arrests. I'm a, a card carrying garden variety economist. Um, uh, Gary Becker's 1968 paper was the very first thing I'd ever read on crime. I was enormously surprised. We were so surprised we uh, tried to replicate it to see if this could be a real thing. In the 2013-14 academic year, we did another experiment of becoming a man with 2000 ninth and 10th graders, and we saw a 50% reduction in violent crime arrests there. And I should also mention that in this first experiment, we also see uh, something like a 20%, 20% of the control mean increase in high school graduation rates as well. So this sort of behavioral science informed approach um, seems really encouraging. Now, you might look at this and say, and we looked at this and said, um, this is very encouraging, but you know, we've known since 
the great Marvin Wolfgang that the violence problem is disproportionately driven by a very small share of, uh, of people, uh, that 6% who does 60 to 70% of the violence, those might not be the kids who are still in school, in high school. And so can this be useful for kids who are in a deeper part of the ex-ante violence risk um, distribution? And so we went to the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. So this is where the, the county holds the highest risk juvenile, what the county, the, the system believes is the highest risk um, juvenile arrestees in, in Chicago. It's out on the west side of Chicago on Roosevelt Road. This is a, a picture of the facility. And we, um, we worked with the uh, administrator, Earl Dunlap, um, of the facility at the time. And they were on their own rolling out a uh, similar sort of behavioral science informed intervention throughout the facility. And because of capacity constraints, they were just doing this one facility, uh, one residential unit at a time um, through the, uh, through the um, uh, facility. And um, as they were rolling this out, they were about halfway through. Um, the detention staff said so they were having their detention staff administer the program. And about halfway through the rollout across the units, the, the union representing the detention staff filed a lawsuit against uh, the facility. And um, a judge ordered a, a cease and desist order against Earl Dunlap and prevented him from diffusing the program to the other residential units within the, the larger facility. The one time that public sector unions in Chicago um, have been really, really helpful uh, for experimental research. Um, so the facility was frozen in place. Uh, Earl said he had no uh, strong prior views about which incoming kids to the facility would benefit more from the program. So we worked with him to essentially flip a coin to decide which new kids coming in would go to the behavioral science programming units versus the status quo units. And when we followed the kids after exit, so we tracked 2,700 kids who had gone through the, uh, the facility during this randomization period. And we can see something on the order of a 20% drop in recidivism through a year and a half after program exit. Really, really remarkable um, uh, changes, I think. Okay. Now, you know, when, when many of us, so when many of us think about behavioral science and policy, I think the thing that comes immediately to mind is um, the amazing work of my Chicago colleague, Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein um, on nudges. Um, and nudges, if you're not familiar with them, are really low cost changes to the choice environment that try and change people's behavior. Now, usually the magnitude of the behavior change is relatively modest, but the cost is close to zero. And so if you think about a benefit cost ratio where the denominator is, is essentially zero, a lot of these nudges are amazing in their benefit cost ratios. They're cheap, really easy things to do um, that, have, uh, that incrementally push us towards social good. And I think one of the things that I've started to appreciate doing these field experiments in Chicago is that there's a different way to think about behavioral science and its approach to public policy, which some psychologists have started to call boosts. These are interventions that um, they no longer have zero marginal cost. So BAM costs something like several thousand dollars per kid, but the size of the behavioral, behavioral impact here can be really, really large. I would think of a 50% reduction in violent crime risk for kids as a really, really large uh, impact. That's analogous to what we saw in the great crime drop uh, of the 1990s. Um, that's about the size of the drop in the US homicide rate that we saw. Now, um, in, as we sort of, uh, uh, the next thing that I wanted to say by way of, of winding down and, and closing with some final thoughts here is, um, you know, the thing that I think crime researchers for many, many years had been focused on was how to make sense of um, the crime problem and crime control. And I think one of the things that all of us have developed a much greater appreciation for over the last several years, especially over the last year in particular, is the enormous importance into devoting equal attention and scholarly energy into understanding ways of reducing the harms imposed by the criminal justice system itself. And we can see that, as I mentioned before, not just in survey data, but in the millions of people who have been marching um, all across the United States and all over the world, 
to think about how to reduce the harms of incarceration and how to reduce the harms of a different form of gun violence, which is, um, um, which is police use of force against civilians. And so um, I think the, the, the next thing that I just wanted to point out is, and so anyone who has seen, let me just uh, add here, um, anyone who has seen the video or images of a police officer shooting a 50 year old Walter Scott running away as part of a traffic stop um, will immediately agree and see that this is um, a first order public policy problem that um, everyone from the criminology and, and crime research world um, needs to be engaged in trying to solve. And what I wanted to point out is that behavioral science has a potentially important way, a role to play for this as well. So um, several years ago, Emily Owens and David Weisberg and their co-authors published a wonderful paper in criminology and public policy about, uh, about an RCT that they carried out with the Seattle Police Department that in my mind, I see, I don't know if Emily, I don't wanna put words in their mouth, but in my mind, I see lots of echoes of the Becoming a Man program in terms of the underlying mechanism of action. I have come to think of this almost in a way that is analogous to kind of BAM for police. And so what they did is they had essentially police officers come in and go through a recent event with their supervisor where the supervisor helps that get them to reflect on the event. They didn't, they didn't pick an event that went particularly well or an event that went particularly badly. They just picked a recent event and the supervisor helped the officer reflect on how the event went, what they were thinking, what they were assuming, what they might've done differently, how everything went. And um, in the RCT evidence, what you can see when you follow officers out after this supervisor interaction, um, you can see that there's something like a 13 to 26% reduction in arrests, depending on the follow-up time period that you look at, and up to a 50% reduction in police use of force, right? And so what we're seeing here is we're seeing that even a lot of the, even a lot of the criminal justice system harms might also be due to what you might think of as bad decisions in difficult situations and behavioral science has something to say about how we can reduce those harms as well in the short term. Now, I would say, as I sort of look at this, I would say uh, that this is a, a research, um, a research uh, uh, program that is in its very, very early stages, thinking about um, taking all of the lessons about human judgment and decision-making from behavioral science and thinking about ways of uh, using those to reduce the harms of gun violence and reduce the harms from the criminal just, justice system itself. We are in the earliest stages of this, and there's an enormous amount to do and an enormous amount left to learn. And I would say one of the most important first things that I think we need to learn is, you know, I've given you just a very high level uh, outline of um, the candidate psychology through which these sorts of interventions might be changing behavior on the ground. And I would say there's a lot more that we need to understand about those psychological mechanisms still. And so let me just give you uh, an example to illustrate what I mean. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the most famous um, uh, experiments, lab experiments in all of psychology, if you, if you say to any psychologist, oh, I'm talking about the copy machine study, everyone knows exactly what what you mean. And so let me describe the copy machine study for, uh, for a second here. So the, um, the psychologists get a bunch of undergraduates um, to participate in a lab study. And, you know, um, the psychologists say to the undergraduates, for starters, oh, before we get started with the actual study, I, um, I need you to go make some, some copies in the other room. And so the, the undergraduate study subject goes into the other room and there's a bunch of other people in line for the copy machine, unbeknownst to the subject, they're confederates of the investigator. And, you know, as they're in line and they're getting closer to the front, they're getting closer to the copy machine, a different confederate tries to cut in line to make five copies of a, of a sheet of paper. And um, what's randomized across subjects is um, what the confederate who's trying to cut in line says to the study subject. So one treatment condition here is the, the Confederate tries to cut in line with no reason given. 
And the study subjects say yes, and they let the person uh, cut in line about 60% of the time. Um, and another study condition here is the, uh, the Confederate will give a real reason for why they want to cut in line. Um, they say something like, uh, do you mind if I cut in line to make five copies because I'm in a hurry? And the third condition in this lab experiment is the Confederate tries to cut in line and gives a fake reason that gives the veneer of a reason. Do you mind if I cut in line because I need to make some copies? Now, what's interesting about this is like, think about our own, think about our own sort of automatic, uh, our own automatic cognition here. Whenever someone gives us a reason, usually we don't even pay that much attention to what the reason is. You know, we hear someone give us some sort of reason or other. We think about this as a situation we've been in lots of times before. Um, someone's got to do something. They've got some reason for it. I'm going to let them do it. Um, we deploy our automatic response to let them cut in line. Um, we confuse the situation of a veneer of a reason with an actual reason. And you can see the rate at which we let people cut in line is almost identical for the fake reason and the real reason, which is really quite striking, OK? Now, um, what does this have to do with the behavioral science interventions? Well, um, let me tell you the, the coda to this lab experiment now. The coda to this lab experiment is they redid the whole experiment now and asked the Confederates who were trying to cut in not to ask to make five copies, but to ask to make 20 copies. Now, all of a sudden, this is a much bigger ask. This is a much bigger ask of the person in line. And so if you think about all of us doing our own sort of benefit cost calculation about whether it's worth slowing down and thinking more about this, whether it's worth engaging in deliberate system two cognition, the cost of, of automatically complying has gone back up. And what you see in this case is people seem to be thinking more. The share of study subjects who say yes and let the person cut when it's 20 pages, not, not five copies, goes back down to 60%, which is exactly what you see with no reason. Okay, This is one candidate hypothesis for the psychology for how these programs are working, which is maybe all we're trying to do here is literally just help people better understand the high stakes situations where they need to engage deliberate to cognition. And that's it. That's all we need to do. But there are other hypotheses here as well, which is maybe we need to give people more structure about their metacognition. We need to give them specific guidance about how they think about their own thinking. And I would say we understand remarkably little about this right now. I would say this is enormously important for realizing the unreal, currently unrealized untapped potential of behavioral science in addressing both gun violence and criminal justice harms. So that's one, I think, strand of research that will be enormously important is better understanding the, um, the psychology here. And I think the other strand of, of what we need to understand is something that I think social science in general has not understood yet at all about anything. So, um, in the category of be careful what you wish for, um, when the first Becoming a Man experimental results came out, um, the mayor of Chicago at the time, we sent a copy to, uh, to the mayor, it was Rahm Emanuel at the time, he got very excited. Uh, we held a press conference with him at Harper High School in the Englewood neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Um, not long after that, the city of Chicago made the Becoming a Man program a centerpiece and programs like it a centerpiece of the city's larger anti-violence strategy. The city, as well as the city's philanthropic partners, poured lots of additional money into expanding Becoming a Man all over the city. If you are in the business of experimental criminology, if you're in the business of evidence-based policy, this is exactly what you hope for evidence redirecting public sector resources to do things that you believe will be socially helpful. That's why we are all doing what we are doing. Let me just talk you through this first graph here. So um, this shows you the impact. I told you that uh, becoming a man improved schooling outcomes. So I'm showing you the size of the schooling outcome on the y-axis and I'm showing you the number of kids who participated in BAM in three waves of our uh, different BAM RCTs over time. And you can see that when you know, when we had, you know, something like eight or 900 kids participating in BAM in that first year, there were very sizable gains in schooling outcomes for kids. As the program 
expanded, served more kids across the city over time, you can see now the confidence intervals here are very sizable. We can't rule out more modest impacts, but it certainly looks to your eyeball test like there might be some attenuation in the program impact as the program scale increased. And you can see something similar with the impact on arrests in the second panel or violent crime arrests specifically in the final panel. We see some suggestive evidence, again, recognizing the size of the confidence intervals, some suggestive evidence of attenuation in the program impacts as the program expands. And so I think this, in my experience, is something that is just uh, a, common, a common feature to social policy across the board, not unique to behavioral science informed programs. And I think social scientists have not had a whole lot to say about how to solve this over the years because historically, I think up until, in some ways, up until sort of the experimental um, paradigm in the so social sciences, historically, we haven't thought of ourselves as being in the business of solving social problems rather than just understanding social problems. And so we haven't devoted much thought to the scale up pr problem. I think if we can solve that, there's an enormous amount of potential here. Um, you know, I think the core idea behind all of this was really brought home to me many years ago when we were inside the juvenile detention center, we were talking to a staff member there who said, this is him saying this to us now in the, in the juvenile detention center. He said, um, you know, 20% of the kids in here are like very high risk. They're dangerous. If you let them go, they're just, they're gonna hurt people. But the other 80% of the kids in here, I always tell them, if I could give you back just 10 minutes of your lives, um, none of you would be here. Another way to sort of say that is he's articulating this hypothesis that even some of the most serious violence that we see in the country is not necessarily due to bad people, but to human fallibility in difficult situations. You know, I think the the tragedy from a public policy and a, and a humanitarian perspective is we have responded to the to that ten minute window problem um, largely through increasing our prison and jail populations over the last fifty years. I think the reason for hope here is that we were beginning in the early stages of developing a framework and some insights that can help us do a better job of assisting young people in navigating these difficult 10 minute windows uh, when they confront them. And with that, let me say uh, thank you again, uh, Larry and to the Stockholm Symposium for having me be part of this. It's such a great honor. And let me close with once again, congratulating both Frank and uh, Phil on this wonderful and well-deserved honor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ludwig. We are really given a lot of hope, but also a strong sense of challenge as we try to pursue the potential of the experimental method uh, to solve uh, problems uh, with the expectation from medicine, engineering, and other fields that the percentage of solutions that actually work will be pretty small indeed, as, uh, as Professor Ludwig pointed out early uh, in the lecture. Um, but we are uh, we're thrilled by the fact that there's so much more experimental knowledge now to work with that we're teaching so many more uh, police and social workers and um, prison officials and probation officers, uh, these kinds of results. Um, and they're demanding more than ever uh, to have some help in understanding what they mean, exactly how they can apply uh, this work, but increasingly to uh, design their own experiments and to uh, pursue uh, ways that they think uh, you might not attenuate effects uh, over time um, and once they understand that problem. Uh, and I think all of it in this lecture. I know that Jerry Lee, who is uh, one of the um, uh, founders of uh, experimental criminology at Cambridge and uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, but also the original donor of the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, uh, who will be watching today, will be very pleased at what we have heard from Professor Ludwig today. I hope you can all take away uh, these insights. And if you want to follow up with him to contact him at the University of Chicago, uh, we are uh, very grateful to Professor Ludwig for taking the time to be with us today. We, sh we wish he could have taken more time to get on a plane and fly to Sweden, but uh, that wasn't his fault. So uh, with that, uh, let me now um, conclude and to declare officially uh, at an end 
uh, the 2021 Stockholm Criminology Symposium. Uh, may we all have better luck for 2022 uh, to come together in Stockholm in June and perfect weather uh, as we will always uh, anticipate uh, in Stockholm at that time. Travel safely, uh, stay safe when you're at home uh, and come back to Stockholm as soon as possible. Thank you, Jens, thank you all uh, and good evening.